Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Winnie Van Lanningham, and after seeing just how much the public knows about the adventures and exploits of Earth's Mightiest Heroes at AvengerCon, I gotta know how much of the MCU is common knowledge within its own canon. In an interview with Marvel.com, executive producer Sana Amanat explained her take on what the public knows about Endgame at the con. She said, quote, People might know some things, but they don't know all the things. They don't know everyone's actual code name or their real name, because it's the ground's eye view of the Marvel Universe. These are just regular civilians putting this convention together. But us viewers at home aren't normies, baby, so let's break down exactly how and what these civvies know about their own universe. The earliest traceable point of public Avengers knowledge in the MCU was the wartime propaganda centered around Captain America. From his USO tour to comic books, the star-spangled man with a plan became a deep and popular part of the United States of MCU America's cultural identity. Seeing as Avengers Con touts its location at Camp Lehigh as the home of Captain America, and counting the numerous star-spangled singer cosplayers that attend it, it's fair to say that some version of Cap's wartime mythos still permeates the public consciousness of Feige 616. We can actually fast forward through most of Phase 1 and 2 from here. While plenty of events such as the Battle of New York or Aldrich Killian's kidnapping of President Ellis would have obviously drawn global coverage, smaller events such as Thor's battle against the Destroyer in New Mexico could potentially be public knowledge now thanks to Black Widow. In The Winter Soldier, Natasha dumped S.H.I.E.L.D.'s entire database to counter Hydra's uprising. During her public testimony with the Department of Defense, she was accused of laying ways to the U.S.'s entire intelligence apparatus, which gives us a rough sense of how many MCU origin stories would be public knowledge. As long as Coulson, Galaga Guy, or some other S.H.I.E.L.D. agent wrote up a briefing, it stands to reason that plenty of first-hand accounts throughout S.H.I.E.L.D.'s history are accessible to civilians. Even if damage control was done to delete these files, there would still likely be a cottage industry of reporters, historians, and YouTubers with file copies to share. Although, this S.H.I.E.L.D. leak doesn't necessarily cover everything. In Falcon and the Winter Soldier, for for instance, we learn that Isaiah Bradley's existence, imprisonment, and forced experimentations were swept under the rug. According to Bucky, this information was kept even from Steve. While Bradley was technically U.S. Army, not S.H.I.E.L.D., he did combat Hydra and the Winter Soldier, so it would be logical for S.H.I.E.L.D. to have files on America's second super soldier. It seems likely that certain events, particularly ones that highlight government-sanctioned atrocities, could have been scrubbed from the record or done entirely off the books prior to Natasha's leave. Moving further into Phase 2, we have a handful of notable events that would get basic news coverage. The transpirings of Age of Ultron from Hulk's rampage in Johannesburg to Ultron's annihilation of Sokovia would all get major worldwide coverage. These events, in addition to the casualties incurred in the botched Lagos mission, would swing a sizable portion of public opinion against the Avengers, and ultimately led to the UN drafting the Sokovia Accords. It's hard to say how much detailed knowledge reporters would have on these incidents, but with pressures of accountability racking Tony with guilt, I can see him being as transparent as he was when he revealed the death tolls that built Stark Industries back in Iron Man. Based on gym coach Andre Wilson's remarks in Homecoming, the fallout of Civil War might be somewhat shrouded in mystery to the public. He says that he's pretty sure that Cap is a war criminal now, hinting that the world might not know the details of the Avengers' big breakup, but they definitely can piece together that it was a result of the Accords. In the same scene, Liz Allen says that security footage of the airport battle was uploaded to YouTube. Based on my experience with YouTube, CCTV footage of an Avengers Battle Royale is exactly the type of video to get over a billion views. The majority of Phase 3 between Civil War and Endgame is off-world or self-contained, so it's likely that the public doesn't have a super clear understanding of these events. The happenings of Doctor Strange, for instance, are unlikely to be public knowledge, as almost nothing in that movie occurs in the open. We know that Spider-Man does have a local and online following at this point, but considering that Peter's secret identity is a vital part of his character, I don't think that the minutia of his heroics is well known. The biggest global news headline during this period would definitely be Wakanda coming out of isolation. While T'Challa is willing to share their technological advances with the world, I think anything regarding Killmonger's coup is probably kept purposefully vague or secret, for national security reasons. This brings us to Infinity War and the era of the blip. One of the most interesting Easter eggs to come out of the first episode of Ms. Marvel is a sign advertising the release of a memoir titled I Was There that supposedly outlines what happened during the Battle of Earth. This is definitely a blinking you'll miss it detail, but thankfully the folks at Marvel helped fill in some of the blanks for us. According to an article posted on Marvel.com, I Was There is a post-Endgame autobiographical story written by an anonymous S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who was apparently 
literally right in the middle of the action. It contains an interview with Hawkeye about the battle and details the clash between the heroes of Earth and the alien scourge threatening our fragile planet. The author also boasts a first-hand account of Tony Stark using the Infinity Gauntlet. However, Marvel.com tells us that this is a point of contention, as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in question was apparently 6,000 feet away when Tony did the final snap. Side quest, if they really were there, this person is a huge bag of dicks for not cluing in Nick Fury. In Far From Home, we learn that he came back from the blip with no team, no intel, and a high school kid dodging his calls. Mystery homie, if you're a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and you're not immediately giving Fury the lowdown, I pity you, because he's gonna find out who you are and hit you with a deeply uncomfortable glare. But this agent isn't the only one from the battlefield talking about Endgame. In addition to their interview with Hawkeye, Kamala herself tells us that Scott Lang also has a podcast detailing the Battle of Earth. In my head canon, Luis is his fast-talking podcast co-host who tells us all the crazy, stupid, fine details of their conquest. He would crush that gig. And you can do it from home if you're a convicted felon. It seems like Ant-Man really went into detail talking about each hero's role in the fight against Thanos, enough that Sloth Baby Productions was able to crank out a 10-video series about them. I think it's highly likely that other Avengers have shared their sides of the story along the way as well. Beyond what we've learned from Ms. Marvel, there are a few other potential information pipelines that could have publicized the Battle of Earth and the Battle of Wakanda within the context of Endgame. Captain America led a grief support group for Blip survivors, where I imagine he probably opened up about the events in order to help others find closure about what happened to their loved ones. We also saw posters advertising grief support groups and even blip survivor dating apps in Shang-Chi, so his influence clearly spread to other parts of the US. Then we have Professor Hulk, who was approached by children and photographed, leading me to believe that he's garnered some amount of attention for his role in saving the world since merging Dr. Banner and the other guy. We know that Thor outright refused to say Thanos' name or speak of the incident due to his post-traumatic stress. So I don't think that he spoke to any news outlets. But I don't know, man. That dude was sad and drunk as hell, and I do think that it's possible that he unloaded his grief on a poor, unsuspecting gamer at some point. And according to that Avengers Con article on Marvel.com, there's also a book for sale there called Carol, a definitive account of the Cosmic Avenger, a book aimed to unfold the true identity of Captain Marvel. This tells me that someone must have gotten up close and personal to her too. Based on some of the media surrounding the Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't think that any of them give specific interviews. Although I'm sure Star-Lord would have loved to give his thoughts on Footloose to any reporter, writer, or citizen who asked. At the table where the Drax cosplayer is posted up, you can see a DVD case for A Pal to All Planets, the Peter Quill Starboy story. According to Marvel.com, this is a 40-minute docu-series that promises to show viewers wonders beyond imagination, as Quill journeys through the universe in search of his home. In addition to this DVD calling Peter Starboy, we also see a t-shirt featuring Groot as Mr. Tree, and a display setup called Trash Panda Alley in honor of Rocket. All of their names are completely made up, lending to the idea that no third party has spoken directly to them. We did see Nebula getting used by Thanos as a human projector in Endgame, however, so clearly her cybernetic parts have visual and audio recording capabilities, which can be replayed at any time. Her account is technically preserved should any future DVD makers want to know what happened from her perspective, but the likelihood of her complying with such requests seems slim to none. But other third parties have also made content to explain the aftermath of Infinity War and Endgame. For example, there's Paul Greengrass, director of The Snap, the in-flight entertainment option on Peter's plane ride to Europe and Far From Home. In real life, Greengrass is a director known for dramatizations of significant historical events, such as United 93, the docudrama about the attack on 9-11. Then there's Heart of Iron, the Tony Stark story, a feature-length documentary that chronicles the life and legacy left behind by the world's greatest hero, Tony Stark. My theory about this doc is that the people who worked on it were made privy to Tony's personal story via Stark Tech. We learned in Homecoming pre-Infinity War that Peter's Spidey Suit's training wheels protocol also came with the baby monitor protocol. And my guess is that all of Tony's other suits also have this feature, minus the intentionally demeaning codenames. I mean, these suits are decked out in every way imaginable, including HD targeting and visual interfacing tech. Why wouldn't all of Tony's suits come with a record feature? In the very beginning, he used to tape himself testing out each new suit design and realized somewhere down the line that it would also be helpful to see himself in action. Not only only is he a huge narcissist who probably plays back all of his fight sequences just to see how badass he looks. By the time Endgame happened, I bet every single one of his suits were outfitted with recording capabilities. Spider-Man, Iron Man, War Machine, the Hulkbuster, and Rescue were all front and center of the battle, so their suits would have caught all the action. It's possible that, in the aftermath of Tony's death, Stark Industries was compelled to share their findings with the US government, or maybe even the United Nations, because if I were a world leader, I would definitely demand to know 
what the hell evil Daddy Grimace was doing with those deadly gushers on his glove. Even if Pepper didn't want to give up her partner's tech, she may not have had a choice. The entire world wanted to know exactly what happened, and she may have had to show select people in power those tapes. Then there's the real possibility of disgruntled Stark employees like Mysterio and his crew leaking these recordings. Far From Home made it clear that plenty of Stark employees didn't see eye to eye with their boss, so it's not a huge stretch to think that an insider could have leaked files and footage. Heck man, it could even be a member of Quentin Beck's crew. Once they got control of Stark's network of satellites thanks to Peter handing over Edith, they'd presumably also get access to these files. Considering that they'd be in orbit of a massively public court trial thanks to Beck outing an Avenger's identity, it stands a reason that one of these cunning nerds could have traded backup copies of Stark footage for judicial leniency. And this may be where the DODC comes in. We know that they seized Stark assets after Spider-Man was doxxed by Mysterio, and now they've been working to hunt down new persons with enhanced capabilities. With Marvel releasing Armor Wars sometime in 2023, this confiscated Stark tech with potential video footage from the Avengers' various battles might come back to haunt us down the line. I'm also curious to know how many people are aware of exactly what happened in Westview, New Jersey. Obviously, Dark Darcy, Monica, and Jimmy have binge-watched WandaVision, and other members of S.W.O.R.D. were also there when Wanda's reality was broadcast to their TV sets outside of the Hex. But I wonder if any of the MCU's civilians have seen my favorite show. I mean, realistically, I don't think that 616's Disney Plus bought the rights to a woman's grief and packaged it for regular folks, but the details of Wanda's telecasting leave some wiggle room for additional onlookers. According to WandaVision's showrunner Jack Schaefer, Wanda was subconsciously editing, scoring, and producing her show as a cry for help. To do so, Darcy says that the Hex emitted extremely high levels of cosmic microwave background radiation with a broadcast frequency embedded within it. All it took was a cathode ray television with a pair of rabbit ears to hone into this over-the-air signal. Hypothetically, anyone with a similar setup could tune into WandaVision. And considering Wanda's power level, the strength of this broadcast frequency could reasonably range across the globe. There's a non-zero chance that someone other than from S.W.O.R.D. has seen Wanda's show, which was running up until Wanda cuts off the signal IRL in Episode 7. Additionally, Westview hostages must have gone on the record at some point after they were released. It's not every day that you get kidnapped by a superhero infused with an Infinity Stone, so I'm sure that at the very, very least, some teenager from that town made a TikTok about their experience. And like I said, organizations like S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA have had classified docs leaked from within in the past. It's also possible that someone from S.W.O.R.D. will eventually come forward, especially after Wanda almost destroyed reality a second time in Multiverse of Madness. This potential leak could explain why Bruno and Kamala called the light-up gloves for her cosplay Photon Gloves. That it's a capital P in the subtitles, suggesting this is a proper noun. This might be a stretch because photon isn't just Monica Rambeau's call sign, it's a regular old science word. But what if Ms. Marvel knew to call them photon with a capital P gloves because of leaked information about Monica from Westview? We also see Kamala fall back into bed upright when she's fantasizing about her upcoming evening at AvengerCon, a move that mirrors one of the commercials for Nexus antidepressants in WandaVision. Could she have copied this style in her daydream because she saw this ad somehow? Again, I could totally be reading way too much into these details, but it would be really interesting if WandaVision made its way to the public. We also have to give credit to the average citizens themselves for their own first-hand recording of encounters with the Avengers. Like in real life, everyone in the MCU is constantly glued to their televised news, cell phones, and social media. Just like you are right now. Hello, I am your cell phone, bleep lorp. Charge me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to the vast array of canon media outlets in the MCU, the general population has always had a fairly solid idea of what happened during each of the battles that have occurred over the last several years. The footage shown on the news, on live streams, on YouTube, and print media always comes from regular humans experiencing these events. Their knowledge, however, is limited compared to what we know as fans, and to what the characters themselves have gone through in-universe. Like Sarah Aminat said, they don't know everything. For example, there probably wasn't anyone tweeting during Shang-Chi's dragon fight with his dad and Ta Lo, so only a few select people know him as a world hero. But everyone from San Francisco to Macau knows who Bus Guy is, thanks to the dude who livestreamed the fight on his cell phone. And then of course there's Flashpoint, a truly limited edition memoir written by Flash Thompson that definitely vanished along with all that sweet, sweet royalty money the second that the world forgot about Peter Parker. Flash, like the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who published I Was There, was able to capitalize on his book because he truly had the receipts to back up his writing. This dude has been Instagramming and live streaming all of their classmates' adventures, and even though we know the 
that he doesn't know jack shit about Spider-Man or Peter, he's able to easily convince the world that he's Spidey's best friend because he has convincing proof. So far in Ms. Marvel, we've already seen the video of her saving that little boy on the minaret go viral. And my guess is that it won't be the last time our girl ends up on social media this season. Not only is Kamala obsessed with YouTube, her teenage peers are glued to the internet. That popular girl Zoe is even an influencer. It's like Mysterio said, the story you created is totally ridiculous and apparently exactly the kind of thing that people will believe right now. After all the crazy shit that the people of Earth have witnessed in the MCU's lifespan, <laughs> Of course they'll believe anybody who offers even the slightest proof that they know what's up with these superheroes. And based on everything that we saw at AvengerCon, I think it's pretty safe to say that most of these humans are using their imaginations to fill in the gaps that Scott Lang's podcast just can't fill. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at WhitneyPuppy, follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love, and thanks for watching. Bye!